So somebody asked, in light of the last few months revealing uh, that many churches have the lack of conviction, how long do you stay in fight in your church and endeavor to reform? And when do you pull the trigger and pull the emergency eject button and, and get out of Dodge? I'm going to give that to Toby. <laughs> I'm going to give it back to you. Uh, you brought it up. Let's keep it simple. Leave now. No, I mean, it's probably sooner than you want to. I mean, it's, it's going to be much easier to accommodate relationships and try to just get along. But you have to seriously consider whether or not you're comfortable with your kids being excommunicated. And that kind of thing. And you should, the answer is you should not be. You should not be okay with that. So if you have, if fellowship is available to you, you're not going to train any fellowship when they stop. So if they've stopped meeting, if they've stopped serving communion, it's not happening. You going elsewhere is not a betrayal of that because that no longer exists. They're the ones who said it was irrelevant. They're the ones who shut it down. Oh, um, and you go, and if you come back later, that's fine, but... You gotta go. You gotta go find somewhere where you can feed your family, and not worry about disloyalty to a place that's no longer feeding families. The other thing I would just add to that would be, I think sometimes we have high hopes that we might be able to be influential at some point, but I think typically as the everything the stakes go high, um, either you have influence or you don't. So if you don't already have influence, you're not gonna you're not gonna get it. And so I, I think that's a kind of a threshold sort of question where I would just say, well, as God, I mean, if God's already put you in a position where you have influence in your city and in your church and so on, then, then don't abandon that post. But I think a lot of people have really high hopes that they're going to somehow miraculously be given that influence. And I think, but when, when the battle's already started, they're not going to ask someone from the other side to help them advise them in their battle plan. So I, and objects in motion tend to stay in motion. Once, once it's going, having enough influence to turn a tide is a lot of influence indeed. Crowds flow downhill. <laughs> um, and how troubling is it um, that uh, in this moment when so many people are full of fear, panic, insecurity, there's striving, uh, yes, no, masks, no masks, all that, there's, there's that going on. Um, how troubling is it that uh, many churches have opted to just shut their doors, not preach the gospel, not proclaim the gospel that's needed in that. Like what you were saying, Toby, is to be a person, you need the gospel. Um, and so how troubling is it that that's what's happened in this moment? Very. I think it's fine. <laughs> Nate's fine with it, but I'm against it. <laughs> no, it's it's terrible. Seven terrible. and a half. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think it's, it's revealing exactly, I mean, how, I mean, the fact that many churches think that um, being on Zoom is the same thing as they were doing on Sunday morning tells you basically what you need to know. Right. Um, and that many people aren't, e many churchgoers aren't even opting to join that. Right. You know, there, there's, there's been studies already that people have right. not joined doing that. I think it's, but I think it's, so it's troubling in that sense, but I think this goes back to some of what Nate was talking about in terms of um, separating the wheat and the chaff and so forth. I, I'm actually incredibly grateful that a lot of the churches aren't meeting. <laughs> I, They're not I, doing any more I, damage right I, now. <laughs> I, think, I think lots of people are realizing, oh, my church doesn't really mean this. It sure. was just a, it was a TV show. So, and I think for some people that will mean that they're no longer getting anything close to the gospel. But I think a lot of people are going to leave that and go find a, 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 reason, a real church. When the churches self-identify as non-essential. Yeah. I just embrace that. Like they got given that tag, Home Depot actually fought. They, you know, they actually, they actually fought to be essential. Tesla fought to be essential. The pot shops. The pot shops, the liquor stores, yeah. the casinos, Gavin Newsom's vineyards, <laughs> all essential. And the churches said, hey, we're out. Yeah. Like, well, call us when you need these frivolous activities again. And, and if at the same time they're not meeting, but various leaders in them are attending the BLM rallies, then you know exactly what's going on. Uh, somebody asked you, Nate, what, what, what you would expound on the women are the bedrock of culture. Can you expound on, on that comment? They're the really hard rock 
that's underneath <laughs> the culture. Define bedrock. Uh, so, uh, yeah, define bedrock. Yeah. It's, it can be volcanic. It can be... Uh, yeah. Um, try building a culture without women. Yeah. <laughs> they also so, make people. Yeah. So it is... They are quite literally the bedrock of culture. It's uh, also without women for men to... Uh, sacrifice themselves for, to live for, uh, men are completely useless and will descend into some, the closest thing to civilization they'll have is cell block C. You know, it's going to look real grim, real fast. Uh, they don't have, men don't have purpose, they don't have uh, a bullseye, they don't have a target, they don't have something to, you know, to build, someone to build for, someone to build with. Uh, so, while at the, in the creation mandate, at the beginning, Eve arrives as a, as a helpmate, she's given to Adam as a helper, she also provides that focal point for all his constructive energy. Um, she's the build site. Like, this is the build site. This is the build site where all of mankind came from. Eve. And then, down the line, we have Mary. Oh, and we and it's it's fun that you get the ge the female genealogy. We get the the hit points of all the scandalous women of history uh, through the Old Testament uh, who got to be in that you know messianic line. Uh, women are the bedrock of culture. They are the bedrock of uh, any culture. So good culture, bad culture, like it's in order for it to be a culture, a building has a build site. Oh, otherwise you have a gang. So you either have like a pack of wolves, a gang, people knifing each other, or you have a culture. And if you have a culture, then you need women. And you need them at the, at the ground level. Uh, somebody asked for both uh, Nate and Toby, you both stress the importance of not only obeying God, but doing so cheerfully. Uh, what advice would you give to someone who for the most part is obeying God uh, going to church, I, lo I love the qualification, for the most part, is obeying God, uh, going to church, praying, laying down one's life for others, etc., but not experiencing the depth of joy that you are talking about. What, what, what advice would you give in that situation? Probably, I guess I'd say probably maybe do a little bit of an uh, inventory. The Christian joy is fundamentally knowing that your sins are forgiven. So in, in, in the key text that I would walk someone through, um, Psalm 32, Psalm 51, 1 John 1. Um, uh, Christian joy fundamentally is knowing your sins are forgiven. Um, and so my question would be to that person, well, are your sins forgiven? Um, are you, are there, you know, are, are, is there unconfessed sin in your life? Is there bitterness? Is there resentment? Is there stuff that you haven't dealt with? Um, and if there is not, and then I would say, well, are, you know, are you forgiven? Or do you know that you're forgiven? Uh, if you know that you're forgiven, that's the most, that, that is Christian joy. And that's not the same thing, meaning that like every moment of your life, you're sort of skipping, you know, or, or giggling or something like this. It, it, just, it just means that there's this bedrock, I'm going to use your word, bedrock. It's, that's the, the, the hard. a woman. There's a woman. Is what <laughs> <laughs> that, that you are good, you are right with God. That you are right with God, your sins are forgiven. That's, that's Christian joy. So th that's where I'd want to start. And then I think that you could, you know, some of that might be, might be fine and there might be uh, other things to talk about in terms of just obeying God cheerfully. But I think to chime in on that one, good, good check would be to look what's in your fists because you're probably hanging on to something. Uh, the rich young ruler, it was money. Uh, he obeyed God for the most part. Yeah, for the most part, I had obeyed God. But we, we tend to have things that we take pride in, things that we see as our fundamental to our identities, things that we have made our brand and we're not, we're clenching onto them. And so we do things because we know we're supposed to, but then we're still hanging on to something. We're still sneaking something in. There's still one, you know, cat poo under the carpet that's our favorite and we don't want to get rid of it. Uh, and we're wondering why we don't have the aroma of joy. And then the Roomba comes along and <laughs> you know, hits the bump over there. But the, uh, basically, like you do, you do need to take stock. 
but you need to take stock of those things that are really essential to you that you're not letting go of, and you might have to have a very honest conversation with a friend, with a family member, and this will even be a great trial <laughs> where you ask them to tell you honestly. Yeah. Like, what is it? What is the thing that I am hanging on to? And know that you're, if you're braced and they open their mouth and they start to tell you and you're very upset, uh, they're there correct. It is. Found they're it. correct. Found it. <laughs> the other thing too is expectations. I think frequently the idol we have is, the, is an idol of expectations. You think if I obey in this way, it will be like this. But I would go back to the, the George MacDonald um, imagery of God making you into a palace. You're not in charge of this project. And so your job is to obey God and then just watch what he does with it. And sometimes what he does with it is coming fairly shortly, but sometimes what he does with it is coming in a few decades. And that's his job. And so you're not God. <laughs> and, and frequently we're grumpy and grumbly because we think we know what God ought to be doing with this obedience rather than recognizing that he's God and he's the one who does what he wants with your obedience. Yep. And we're not patient. You know, he, God's building a palace. We're farming. It takes a long time. You're pulling stumps. You're planting crops. You're planting trees. Why isn't it all joyful? Why isn't it Christmas every day? Why isn't my Christian walk kind of like watching Monty Python for the first time? <laughs> every time where I am just <laughs> laughing uncontrollably. What, why not? And the expectations are important to control reasonably. The, the Christian life is like a rugby game. You know, it, you, you go forward but the ball keeps going backwards, but somehow it keeps going forward. Um, Toby, can you talk a little bit, we're talking about the school of practical Christianity and inevitably um, there's sort of two ditches on either side. One is uh, legalism, one is to like, okay, let's make a bunch of rules. The 10 that God gave us weren't enough, so let's, let's tack on a bunch of rules. The other side of that is like, you know, God loves you just the way you are, what, whatever could be wrong with you. So can you talk about that striving after holiness um, how do you avoid both of those ditches, the, the legalist ditch, the, the licentious, uh, libertine ditch? Yeah, um, I think uh, part of where I, I closed the way I did was just focusing on Christ, is, is I think if you're chasing after Christ, it really is hard to, to end up in one of those ditches. Um, loving Christ, loving the person of Christ, not the idea of Christ, not a theological conception of Christ, but loving Jesus and, and seeking to see him everywhere he's promised to be revealed. Um, it, you, you can't love Christ and keep um, fornicating with your girlfriend. You can't love Christ and uh, continue stealing from your employer. You can't be chasing Christ and keep lying. And at the same time, um, you, you, it's not, um, to, to chase after Christ is not a burden. If you're chasing after Christ and, um, and you're getting grumpier and grumpier, you're not chasing after Christ. It, you know, to, to know Christ is to know joy himself. Um, so I, I think th that's the key, but I would say, and then, you know, I think the, stay close to the text, stay close to the Bible. That's God's word to us. And where God has spoken, it's, it's life, it's joy, it's goodness. And where God hasn't spoken, then keep your mouth shut. Uh, somebody sent in a question for uh, Pastor Doug, but I'm going to ask you guys, and, and you in particular, Nate. Um, if you could have everybody in this room we'd read one of your dad's books, uh, which book would it be? And we'll, cl we'll close with this. Because we do have a book promo coming up next. Yeah. But. I was going to say, Ride Sally Ride? What? <laughs> <laughs> um, what do you think, Dad? <laughs> um, one of them. Serrated Edge is, is kind of important. Uh, for guys, fidelity of a federal husband, one. Yeah, one. 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 And we're assuming that they're going to listen to it after they read it. You know, and <laughs> I'll say even jellyfish, just because. Oh, good. Toby, do you have a thought? I recently reread Reforming Marriage, and I had read that a number of years ago, and it's, um, it's just wonderful. Um, and and, and there, um, I actually... Even jellyfish, though, is like also very wonderful. I, I told I have this new book coming out, uh, No Mere Mortals from Canon, and uh, I told Doug actually after I read reread Reforming Marriage, I said I'm sorry, but I think I plagiarized half my book. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
and I had totally forgotten. I like, oh, I got that from Pastor Wilson. I got that from I got that from Doug. So uh, it's not quite that bad, but uh, but I was so grateful um, for how much of it I had forgotten, but had completely uh, and re-remembered as as his own. Yeah, like, like, <laughs> as one fellow once said, <laughs> as I always say. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's actually it's but it's incredibly refreshing, incredibly encouraging, and I think if we could use anything, it would be happy marriages, sure. and um, so reforming marriage would be my pick. Good. Well, thank you, gents, for this evening. Appreciate it. Give them thank another. You. Thank you. Of-